Welcome. Really, is that really loud? We're good? good. Uh, welcome to the 2018 is this, NYC what is that? Just for me. Hub for, yeah, me too. Entrepreneurship Summit. So I think most of you guys who are here hopefully know some about our story. Um, but for me, it's been a path of not just embracing machining and manufacturing, but trying to tie that all together with the manufacturing side of this world, or the entrepreneurship side of this world, of bringing this into a business. Um, we've made a lot of friends along the way. And I think one of the cool things today is to bring this community together again um, and you need to hear from a few speakers. Uh, but before we talk about them, uh, I want to give a shout out and a thank you and, and an introduction to Bill Fina, who is the kind of brains and energy behind uh, this facility, M Hub, which um, is one of the coolest facilities, just period. So, Bill, thank you for helping coordinate all this. And do you want to tell us a little bit about what this is? Sure. Thanks, John. Uh, so, welcome to M Hub. This is a manufacturing innovation hub where we help entrepreneurs and industry build and manufacture physical products. Our goal here is to create the conditions for product innovation to thrive. And we do that by giving entrepreneurs access to tools, resources, networks, mentorship, uh, and a community of entrepreneurs that are all building and manufacturing products. Uh, this facility is 63,000 square feet. We got, we got spoiled by this facility. Uh, we're leasing it for Motorola Mobility. They're producing and manufacturing cell phones here. Um, and behind this wall, there's 10 different shops and labs. If you didn't go on the tour already, there will be several tours throughout the day. There's going to be demos on the tour mocks. We actually just got two new tour mocks that I'm really excited about um, about two days ago. We're still kind of setting them up. Um, but we'll have uh, parts being run on our CNC machines. We've got an amazing 3D printer lab um, with a J750 printer. I printed a donut that I can tell you, you think it's yeah. real. It's like, insane. Crazy. Um, it tasted horrible, but it looked great. Uh, but if we scan this donut, and if, you got to see the donut. Uh, the other things that we do here, we, uh, we've got a community of about a thousand members. Uh, they're all building their own startups, their own companies. Uh, they get access to mentorship programs, the educational resources. Uh, we've got about 35 vendors from different industries. And if you advise on how to, how to actually run a business after you, even before you start developing your product. Uh, and then the community, there's it's made up of about a thousand people. We've got mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, iOS, Android developers, uh, materials uh, specialists, physicists, you know, people fabricating in the shop and, and just starting their business. It's great to have access to that shared equipment to just kick things off. Um, and, and the ability to ask people or even contract um, other, other members here to, to help you. Uh, on your journey to build your product. Uh, so we do a lot of programming here at MHUB as well. Uh, today is one of our larger events, um, but we had 300 events last year. So we're excited to bring everyone here. This is going to be an awesome day. We got food trucks coming in a couple of hours. Uh, we actually have beer in the bath and soda and water. Um, and then uh, we'll be taking everyone out. Uh, tonight there's an after party about five blocks away uh, around seven. So looking forward uh, to having discussions tonight with you all. Uh, just seeing what you're inventing. If you have questions about starting a company or if you have an idea, feel free to talk to me. Uh, we've got huge in the Autodesk here. It's very exciting. Yeah. It's awesome. And I would say for the folks that are traveling in um, from out of the Chicago area, you know, the bad news is you don't have an M Hub where you live. And M Hub has really set the bar. I think one of the best maker spaces, I know you probably won't use that term because you're really beyond that as an incubator and a facility. Uh, that we can provide, but it's not just the physical resources that you're going to get to see on the tour, it's the energy of that community, um, and that's such a key thing as an entrepreneur. So uh, if you're if you're interested in this and you're passionate about this, you've got to take that energy and these skill sets and you've got to help grow the makerspace or the uh, SBDIC, like the small business development boards or chamber of commerce or wherever those resources are. Um, you don't find mentors unless you ask them. You don't find communities that are willing to help you unless you put yourself out there. So let this be kind of a role model and a source of inspiration. Um, we're going to do four sessions today. We're going to kick it off with uh, John Grimsmo. If you guys don't know John, he and I have actually had some pretty similar stories. Uh, we both got started with Tormach machines, kind of bootstrap, uh, self taught machinists right out of our garage. And uh, he's become a really good friend. We co host the Business of Machining podcast every Friday where we talk about, try to keep it real about the uh, 
uh, you know, I think lots of people like to talk about the positive stuff of entrepreneurship and the energy and the rewards, and I think that's all true, but we also try to talk about the, the, the tough side of things and the decisions that are difficult to make. Um, so it's been great to get to know John uh, on that front. Um, after that, we've got Jake Pearson, who is an awesome entrepreneur, makes some great products, but has really been an inspiration on awesome. new manufacturing, running kind of a, his own job shop that serves to make his products. Um, after that, we've got the Autodesk, Autodesk team here to talk about um, Autodesk Fusion 360, HSM, uh, the CAM platform, fixture, and so forth. Uh, and then unfortunately, we've had a change on the last time slot. So what we're gonna do, I think, is bring everyone back up here, uh, possibly me and Bill as well, and we're just gonna do an open Q&A. Like, let's talk about the questions that you guys have, uh, but let's make this interactive throughout the day, for sure. So with that, again, hey, let's give a big round of applause to M Hub and Bill Fina. I hope so. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is John Grimsmo. I'm an entrepreneur, knife maker, um, CNC nerd, enthusiast, aficionado. Um, I, I love what I do. Like coming here, being able to speak to you, it's, it's crazy. Like the first speech that I gave was to a group of Cub Scouts when I was 18 years old and I got my Eagle Scout. So it's, it's weird. Um, Let's see, so I'm at IMTS, I figured for three reasons. Uh, the first reason is, is this, is being able to share with you guys with all the conversations I have with Saunders and with every individual person that I've been talking to so far, um, to share my experience, my story, my time, and um, then the second thing is to learn, like to go actually to go to the show, to come to MHub and to learn, I wanna learn about Citizen Swiss Lades, I wanna learn about um, more CAD CAM software, just more details about things that I can do, things that I can apply, tooling, inserts, things like that. Um, and then the third thing is to absorb. Like, you forget how impactful it is to put yourself in a room of people or at IMTS, like 100,000 people that are in your industry and, you know, absolutely love what they do and just kind of to rub elbows. Like, I become friends with Saunders and just the, I can't even quantify the, um, effect that I've had from that, you know, and all the other friends and connections that I've made throughout the past, you know, 10 years in manufacturing, it just culminates and culminates and like grows and grows and grows. And I'm, I love coming to these events. The first, the first event that I went to, um, or the first bunch like 10 years ago, um, I, I did not feel like I belonged. You know, I was just a guy in my garage with a $500 mini mill that I was throwing some stepper motors on. And uh, you know, I go to these big machines with like four hundred thousand dollars for one of these machines, and I, I didn't feel like I belonged there. Um, but then I kept coming back, and I kept coming back, and I kept talking to the same distributors and retailers, and they kept remembering me, and they're like, "Oh yeah, you're that guy who makes knives." So I'm like, "Yep, that's me." And then eventually, those prices of the machines started to seem a little bit more within reach. Um, and then, you know, you feel more comfortable and you know more people and you rub elbows with more people and you learn the industry more and more. And now I go to those shows and I know I can talk, you know, freely with almost anybody and understand what they're saying and, and share information and it's stand here. Like, this is insane. Um, so I'll give you a little bit about my backstory. Right now, we run um, Grimsmo Knives, which is now a team of six people and we manufacture what I like to think are some of the highest quality pocket knives in the world because we put every single ounce of our soul and energy and passion into what we do. So, I mean, with that, we get to, we get to come to work and play every day. Um, but it hasn't happened overnight. It's been, a, I mean, 10 years of manufacturing and then eight years of entrepreneurship before that, just trying to like step your way up and learn and figure out what, what to do. Um, so when I, was, when I was 11 years old, uh, my godfather gave me a boat knife. He was a Coast Guard guy. And he gave me this beautiful leather sheath, Grauman, I think was the brand, um, probably like a $150 boat knife for my 11th birthday. I'm this little kid. And then soon after that, I joined Boy Scouts. I was watching MacGyver. This was the mid-90s. MacGyver was my jam. Um, you know, his MacGyver's little Swiss Army knife, I got into that, so I wanted Swiss Army Knives. And then the very first website that I ever visited in 1995 was Smoky Mountain Knife Works. Yeah. Anybody? Smoky Mountain? 
And so I used to get the paper catalogs and I'd like scroll through every single page and want to buy throwing stars and I always wanted a sword. <laughs> All that stuff. And you don't think about it at the time how much that kind of thing can grow over time. You know, and I spent a good 10 years, like more than that, carrying a knife but never thinking I would, I would go into that industry. And then it kind of comes back to you and you're like, oh yeah, I've been actually doing this for a very, very long time wanting to be in this industry. So, you know, through Boy Scouts, and then I'd get to go camping and hunting and fishing and all that stuff. And then y utilizing the knives and just seeing how, how beneficial they are. And I was that kid that used to take apart the video camera because it was broken, but I thought I could fix it. So I took it all apart in a million pieces, knowing I could put it back together, but it was broken anyway, so I just left it apart. Um, <laughs> who else has done that? I mean, <laughs> yes. So. I was always curious, always fascinated by how things worked, how we can make them better, how, how they were put together. And then to be able to take them apart and like, you know, my, my parents are not really tool people, so we might have had a screwdriver and a hammer, but I, I remember asking them, can I get this set of screwdrivers? Because we don't have a set of screwdrivers. So I wasn't super mechanically inclined throughout my early teens, but then, um, through Boy Scouts and through other projects and things like that. And then I got into mountain biking, which was my, you know, my core for about four or five years. And then I finally realized I liked working on my bike more than I actually liked like going and shredding the mountain because that involved driving there and like effort and sweat and all that stuff. So I'd rather just kind of work on the bike. And then I'd, I'd search all the catalogs and I'd want to buy all the parts and you know, I'd figure out how it all goes together and I want to understand it and clean it and figure it out. And at the time, you're just a kid playing around. You don't really know what, uh, what you're doing. So it's just fun. So I just kept following my passion. And I think that's, that's one of the core lessons I've learned in my life is that I, I do follow my passions. When I find something super interesting, I'll just keep at it. I'll just keep digging in until I'm full. And then I move on to something else. So like with mountain bikes, I learned everything there was about the industry. I, I went on all the forums and all the websites and I got fairly proficient at some of the skills. Like anybody know what bike trials is, a type of biking? Tim Paul in the back? Yeah, so bike trials is like very slow, very precision. You, you stand on your back wheel, you hop around, you ride skinnies, things like that. So that precision to detail and like balance and skill applies to what I do now. And I, I've, you know, I didn't realize, realize it at the time that that would be beneficial in my future, but man, I loved it. Um, love working on my bike too. And then from there, you know, going through high school, I didn't have a lot of like, I was making videos about biking for our video class in high school. So, you know, the fact that I make videos on YouTube now, we have almost 10 million views combined on all the videos, three or 400 views, I stopped counting. I have a full-time media person filming and editing all the videos now. Yet in high school, I was the guy that, you know, wanted to go out and film myself riding bikes and then bring it back to the classroom and edit it on the mini DV tape machines. And it was, it was fun, but it was always nervous, you know, showing the video to the class. Is everybody gonna like it? How's the music? Look at that cool fade. Oh, nobody noticed. But <laughs> <laughs> that's what you do. You, you work hard and you, you put everything you have into it, even if nobody cares. And, uh, you know, I, I look back on my life now, and I'm, I'm 35 years old now, so I'm still a spring chicken, but, you know, I've been around a few things, and I, I look back and how things have changed over my life and how I've evolved, and um, it grows and it grows, and everything compounds on top of itself. Like, I met a young kid where, there he is, sitting in the back, you know, and I see someone like that, and that's me in high school, and I'm like, his dad's bringing him here to IMTS because he wants to come here. And I, I love that. that. That makes me so happy. Um, so, okay, so going through that and then, let's see what else. Bikes, working on bikes. And then I got into cars because my girlfriend, who's now my wife, um, we met on Lava Life, which back in 2002, that was not very cool because everybody on the internet was a creepy stalker. <laughs> but. We kind of figured out how to trick the system because she put her email address as her location and I did as well and we could like not have to pay <laughs> to use the service. So I emailed her right away and then, you know, so she lived an hour away so I had to, I had to get a car. So my mom gave me her 1985 uh, Volvo 240 and uh, we had to 
fix that up because I would drive back and forth, back and forth, and it would break down. I was like, oh, it's, it's mechanical. I can figure this out. So I'd break it, fix it, break it, fix it. And then I started to get like super passionate about cars and bikes started to fade away. And then I was working on these cars. Like that was my passion. That was my, my outlet. You know, I've always had this need to like do and learn and understand everything about everything. So cars for a period of about eight or maybe four to eight years, I can't remember. Um, I wanted to know everything. Turbochargers, how do they work? How does a cylinder work? How does, I programmed uh, custom engine management for my, my cars. I did like four cars with um, the system called Megasquirt, which is a little PCB computer that you buy and you solder it together yourself and you flash on the firmware. This was in 2004 that I was doing that. Kind of like the current version of Arduino, but back then. And you know, I, I drive around literally with the laptop tuning the car. Oh, it needs, needs a little bit more fuel in this spot and you data log it and you'd see all the charts and everything. So all that has totally applied to what I do today. And it's, it was so much fun back then. You know, I'd take my car to the dyno and see how much horsepower it got, and I'm tuning it on the dyno and we'd go to the drag strip every now and then, go autocross racing. Um, it developed a community of friends on this forum uh, called Turbo Bricks. Anybody heard of Turbo Bricks? Wow, five people, that's, I'm impressed. I like it. Um, I was, that, was my, that was my home on the internet for like five, six years. And even then I would, I would do a project on my car, say I welded up a three inch exhaust system for my car, I taught myself how to weld. My dad bought me a $200 flux core welder and uh, I taught myself how to weld a three inch exhaust. And then I'd document the process and I'd, I'd take pictures and I'd put it on the forum and I'd like lay it all out and um, explain how I did it and oh, don't forget to go over the axle because it's better because if you go under, you're gonna scrape and all this stuff. So even back then I was sharing the information with, you know, for basically no return other than just, I learned it from somebody else. So I wanna share it to other people. And so my whole life I've, I've had this need to, to learn everything I can and then to share as much as I can while also being able to do what I love and play because this all feels like play to me. So throughout, fun fact about that forum, I've recently hired a machinist, an aerospace guy who's been like in the industry for 12 years. We were friends on that forum back in the day. And like when he first reached out and he's like, yeah, I'm kind of, you know, thinking about work. And I've, I've known him for so long. I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's work together. And it's been amazing. Um, so the cars were such a great outlet for me because it was like, how, how much can I do for no money? For like hundreds of dollars was so much money. And I didn't really, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. My father's an entrepreneur. I've always kind of had this, this need inside my body to, uh, to do it myself, to not go out and work for the man and get a job and things like that. Not that there's obviously anything wrong with that, but something in my gut told me that it wasn't for me. So I never did. Um, my dad and I, my dad was, is a tech guy. He's been making websites forever, programming, Fox Pro programming, things like that. And so I worked for him throughout later high school and we made all these websites for lawyers and doctors and, you know, fancy people. Uh, architects was really cool. We'd get to go, we'd get a photograph places, put them on the website, edit the pictures. Every little pixel had to be perfect. I had to manually like corner around all the pictures to make them look cool. And that's how I learned kind of the finer points of computer programming and working and making websites and you know how to, how to market, I guess. I never really thought about it as marketing as I do now back then, but, but absolutely. So making these websites, it was fun, but it wasn't fun. It wasn't interesting. It was like boring work. So I knew, I knew there was something else, but that's what I was good at. That's what I did. So while working on cars, spending money, not making any money, I was making a little bit of money on the websites. Um, I actually formed, I moved to Canada to where my wife was. We were living in Washington state at the time with my family. Formed my own company first called Troll Media. That was the beginning. Nobody probably knows this. I don't even think Saunders knows this. Troll Media was my first company. Um, we come from a Viking background, as you can see from the Viking guy logo. Um, Troll Media was my first, I was like 22, 23, my first chance at like, oh, I'm going to do this. Yeah, I'm going to make all kinds of money and be a successful businessman. And, you know, I bought a little sports coat because I thought it looked cool and smart. 
And then my first customer was a um, camshaft manufacturer in uh, Lang Abbotsford, Brit British Columbia. And so my job, because I was into cars, so camshafts were a natural progression, but I get to go to his shop, I got to film, picture, make a website for him. I actually designed an engine in SolidWorks uh, throughout the later of this project that like had working valves and simulation and all that, um, just to be able to put on his website basically. And because I was into cars, I wanted to learn how SolidWorks works. I wanted to learn how to, how to design and manufacture things. So I got to go to his shop and see how these camshafts were ground. And I, that was one of my first um, experiences in a machine shop, you know, very manual machine shop, um, grinding these huge like stone grinding wheels that he bought from far away and had to like dress. And it had that, that smell, that tool oil smell that was pretty, you know, gross and sticky floors because the coolant everywhere, um, dirty, you know, it wasn't a great shop, but it was, uh, it was really cool to be able to go see. It was him and his wife and his son, like this family business that he's happy doing what he's doing. And the work that he does makes cars faster or better or more fuel efficient or whatever he wants the goal to be. So it was a really awesome experience to be able to make that website for him and become friends with him and learn a little bit about how manufacturing worked. And then I went from there and I built my first engine. I blueprinted it, I built it from scratch. You know, I bought all the pistons, piston rings, and I hand fit everything. And I went to my local machine shop and they had a, um, what do you call it? A combo mill drill machine. It's like a lathe with a milling head. Yeah, like a Smithy. Uh, I think it was Grizzly was the brand. Because the Grizzly is actually, one of their stores was in Bellingham, Washington, close to where we lived. So I could actually like drive there and, oh, it's, was it $1,500 or something for a mill drill machine? This was 2006. So I was getting this engine built in this machine shop where he like cleans engine blocks and bores cylinders and polishes crankshafts and grinds valve seats and all that stuff. At the time, there wasn't a, a spot in my mind that thought I would actually get into manufacturing. I just wanted to build cars. I was like, oh, this place is cool. I'm glad I get to come here. It's in my local small town and I get to, I get to see how my engine is being built. That's awesome. And I took some pictures and I put it up on the forum, you know, documenting my engine build process. And, uh, you know, all the specs and all the tolerances and all the dimensions. And it, I just kind of like, I had a reason, because I wanted a faster car, to be able to uh, pursue this project. You know, it's not just information for no reason, because that's pointless. It's like, I, I have a goal. I want to build an engine. I'm going to learn everything there is to bu about building an engine. I learned about, you know, decking the top of the, of the block to get tight squished. That was a big thing. So your pistons stick up a little bit more. And building this engine was a sweet experience. I had my brother working with me, you know, in the garage at home, basically. He's three, three and a half years younger. So he would have been like 14, helping me build this engine or maybe, maybe a little bit older, but um, he was always there when I needed an extra hand to like, lift something or you know when I was converting a car from an automatic to a manual transmission just for fun because I want to learn how to drive a manual so let's just make my car manual why not I'll jump right in and that's kind of the that's what I did so I remember Eric was like wrapped around wrapped a rope around he sat in the front two seats between the two seats he'd lift the end of the transmission so that I could connect the drive shaft and put the cross member thingy under the transmission and so we've always been kind of a team, and Eric works for me now. He's my business partner in, in Grimm's Monives, and hopefully I'll get to that in a second. But um, from the cars, and then I wanted to make parts. After seeing the machine shop, after building my engine, I was like, you know what? I've learned how to weld. I've learned how to design. I've learned how to fabricate. I don't know anything about CNC machining, but I've heard the words, and I've seen other people make cool parts. So I want to make, let me make a short throw shifter for my car. And I want to make it from scratch. Like some people are taking the stock ones and like modifying them. And I did that, of course, and it was awesome. But I'm, I want to make one from scratch. I want to have a spherical bearing. I want to have C-clips. I want to have a needle roller bearing in the bottom. I want to make a cool button on the top, all this cool stuff. So I designed that, you know, in SolidWorks. And then I, I had to figure out how I was going to manufacture everything. So then I'm like, okay, well, eventually I'm going to have to get my own CNC machine. But um, a friend that I knew had a lathe so I could, I could play on that lathe. I could pretend that I was running a real shop and I could like make this shaft with a couple grooves in it so I could put the spherical bearing on. And it, like every step of the way, 
was just such a stepping stone to where I become today that it's it's weird to think back and like string it all together, which I'm doing right now. But it's super like it really works. <laughs> this the the time compounds on itself. Um, I had this friend that was super into rally racing in the same kind of car like Volvo 240 that I was into, and he built up his his business. Um, fixing cars and maintaining them to like a multi-million dollar business and then he sold it he moved out to the country where we lived and he was kind of like one of my first mentors because he said he actually said to me he's like find something that you can make a lot of that you can make enough that the market wants it and then make it better than anybody else wants it and then you have a, a potential for a business there and then th the other way is like find something you can make a million of and just go out and do it that's another thing he said but I'm not, certainly not in the high volume category. Um, but then, so that guy, John, another John, um, helped me kind of formulate the beginnings of my plan for my second business, which was Craving Boost Automotive. Into cars, turbochargers, Craving Boost. Um, I wanted to make blow off valves, short, th short throw shifters, some suspension upgrades, and all this progression led me to that company and that company became a manufacturing company not so much tech websites things like that because it was fun it was passionate i just i just wanted to keep doing it and then my wife my girlfriend at the time we moved across the country over to toronto area so that like the only reason was we couldn't afford a house with a garage she was working part-time basically supporting me throughout this whole process as I'm finding my way, as I'm making little bits of money on websites here and there, as I'm figuring things out. And then we moved across the country to get a house with a two-car garage so that I could play and expand Craving Boost and make more parts and make lots of money because I was like, hey, if we make this many parts and they cost this much, we'll be rich. <laughs> and at first, that's, that's how easy it sounds, right? Like Bill and I were talking about this yesterday. And it's, it's that mentality of, some people have a product first and they're like, oh, if I make a ton, I'll make millions. And then some people think about it more technically, like Bill was suggesting, where you, see, you say like, okay, what's the market study? What's the, what's the customer base? How much are they willing to spend? What's your profit margin gonna be? And I was really bad because I left all those decisions to like way too late. I just wanna make cool stuff. I wanna make enough money to keep making cool stuff, support my wife, eventually have some kids and then play, 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 all day. So that's, that's what I did. We moved to the Toronto area. We, I started expanding the garage. Luckily, my neighbor next door had an old like World War II era lathe. So I was like, hey, Martin, buddy, I see you're not really using that lathe there. You think I can, think I could borrow that for a little bit? He's like, yep, just clean up after yourself. I was like, amazing, oh my gosh, I don't have to buy a thousand dollar lathe right now. Um, which I eventually did like six months later, but the first shifters that I made were on his lathe and it taught me, you know, manual speeds and feeds, how to clear the chips, how to like feed things in, how to put little manual chamfers on everything. It was amazing. And then from there we went, I guess is when I, no, I guess Craving Boost was my second company and I was just expanding that. Um, I knew that I needed some machinery. This was 2008, I wanted some, I wanted to get into CNC machining because I knew that that was the future. I knew it was my way. Um, who here has seen, back in the day, Haas CNC on YouTube? Yeah, enough people. Uh, I watched all of his videos multiple times. He had a Grizzly X2 milling machine that he made uh, brackets and adapters for. So the X2 is like a $500 milling machine that you can just go out and buy from Grizzly and you ha now have a manual milling machine. And for a couple hundred dollars, I forget exactly what he used to charge, but he'd have these brackets that you could put on and then put steppers on and he had plans and everything. And then I was like, I need that, I'm gonna do it, but I'm too cheap to buy his full kit. So I'll buy just the parts that I can't make, like the motor couplers and things like that. But then I made everything else manually and I converted my $500 machine. I put probably a thousand dollars into it. Um, and then all of a sudden I had a CNC milling machine and I could make the craziest cool stuff. One of the first projects I made was an ashtray for my dad's cigars, because every now and then he likes cigars. So I made this cool ashtray with a full engraving on the back, but the font kind of sucked because SolidWorks engraving really sucked back then. And it was super cool. So just before I got the machine, I knew I needed the capital to pull it off. So I asked, um, I was like, man, where, where can I get, I probably need 
$2,000, $3,000 to be able to pull this off. But I'm like, realistically, maybe I can do it for five because I need tooling and things like that. It's so easy to look at things as one thing. I just need the machine, $500. And then I have, even now, you look at big fancy machines, it's like, oh, $200,000. But it's, it's another $100,000 to tool it up. That's a shock unless you're ready for it. So I asked my father-in-law, hey, can I borrow $5,000? please, to invest in this business and to, to get the CNC machine. So I wrote out this business plan and asked if I could borrow, you know, $5,000. I'm going to go the, drive to Pennsylvania. I'm going to get these machines equals profit, right? So I did that. I was able to get the X2. I was able to get a Grizzly lathe. And then I was able to convert them to CNC within the next six months or so and expand Craving Boost. And we were making products. We were selling products making just enough money to like incrementally afford tooling for the next step. More inserts, more end mills, things like that. But the more I did it, the more I realized that my interest in cars was diminishing like, like a crashing plane. And my interest in machining was going up like this. And it took me far too long to realize that that was actually happening. Cause I'm like, I make car parts. I like cars. I'm doing manufacturing so that I can make cars. And then I realized like all of a sudden once I was like, no, 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 like I'm going to these tool shows. I like manufacturing. I like, I like this. I'm spending all my time on this. I'm spending no time on the car forums anymore. Why, why am I still doing this? Maybe I could make something else. So then I started to rack my brain and it took me, it took me a couple years of being in this kind of stasis of not knowing where I was gonna go next. And then that was 2008 to 2011 was making the car parts and not figuring out exactly where I was gonna go. Um, and then I'd take like, a, I, I needed a little bit of money. So I was anodizing paintball guns to make a hundred bucks here and there. And even that wasn't profitable because it took me like eight hours to anodize a paintball gun. So I'm making, oh, I'm making $8 an hour. That's, that's good. Um, but it made just enough money to keep going. And I taught myself aluminum anodizing because I wanted to anodize my own products. Taught myself powder coating for no money. I started watching John Saunders videos back in the day when I was like, oh man, there's this guy, honey, there's this guy in New York that just got this cool machine and he's doing all kinds of crazy stuff and it's, that's awesome. It's like, it's like Haas CNC, but the next step up. So in 2011, I had a guy emailed me and he's like, oh, I see you anodize aluminum. Can you, uh, do you think you can anodize this knife for me? It's a Pro-Tech switchblade automatic knife with aluminum handles and it was black. And he's like, can you make it green? Cause green's awesome. I was like, yeah, I could do that. Stripped it down and uh, anodized it green. And he's like, dude, this is cool. Uh, let me show you these other knives that I have too from my collection. And I was like, whoa, 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 what do you mean collection? People collect knives. I have a Swiss army knife and a Spyderco. I actually had like three or four Spyderco knives at the time. Um, I was like, whoa, that, that thing's $500. Are you kidding me? That was a thousand? What? He's like, yeah, and there's this knife maker, Brian Ty, that lives like 30 minutes away that uh, sells these thousand dollar knives and he, he can't keep up. Like I had to wait nine months to be able to get this knife. Stop. What are you talking about? No, 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 no. And he's like, you have the skills to make this kind of stuff. So this guy, Sean, like opened my world, not just to the knife making, but to entrepreneurship in that sense as well, because he's got a bit of an entrepreneurial streak in him as well. So we, we talked, we went to lunches a bunch, you know, we figured out where this business could go and what we could make. And I was like, man, this is really cool. So the first things I made were these aluminum handles because I knew how to machine aluminum on my little CNC. I knew how to uh, anodize aluminum and nobody was really doing this at the time. And there were these knives where you could just literally unscrew the sides, the handles, and slap on a new one and it would look completely different. So I was like, okay, let's do this. So the first, like the first night that he told me that, I didn't sleep for three days because I was just on the knife forums researching. I was like, oh, this maker, this maker. Okay, this one, yeah, yeah. Learning, like digesting and, and cramming as much information into my head as I possibly can. And then I made these handles and I started selling a bunch, like a couple and uh, started you know, posting on the forums, but even the forums weren't really doing it for me, but I know I needed to in order to kind of get my name out there. And then within two months of that experience, I scraped together $800, which was more money than I should have scraped together. Uh, we couldn't even afford it to fly to Las Vegas where there was a huge USN gathering knife show and then stay at a hotel 
and then fly back and I didn't have enough money for food there so some generous people <laughs> were like yeah you can eat with us no big deal and most of the time I just didn't eat but to go to that show and be able to rub elbows with other knife makers and other industry professionals and I'm talking to this guy you know late at night in a dark room for like 45 minutes and I go oh you're Brad Southern I've been following you I know everything about you and now we're best like really good friends um, and he's like, yeah, I've been making knives for five years at the time. This was 2011. So to be able to go to those shows, like, like you guys all come here, it's that whole rubbing elbows with other people and you never know who you're going to run into and you never know who you're going to meet and make friends with. And it was, it was one of the most transformative experiences of my life was going to that show first, like that little kid in the back coming to IMTS, you know, getting to meet Saunders and everybody else and whoever else is going to meet throughout the show. It's like, it, it's a milestone, you know, it's like a huge stepping stone to go from there. And once I got to that show, I knew that this is my industry. This is my kind of people. This is my kind of product. I know that this is what I want to be doing. So I came back and I was like, honey, honey, you'll never believe it. Like, this is the greatest thing ever. I, I got to make knives. I got to make, I got to make a design. I got to figure it out. It's got to be like this. I, I love CNC machining. And most of the time, everybody in the knife world is like, you got to hand grind everything. You got to hand profile. CNC is the devil. You can't do this. <laughs> it's, it was really tough in the beginning, but I'm like, no, I want to CNC machine. I don't want to get dirty and dusty and grindy. I want to CNC machine. I want to make chips. And there were like two guys out there, Brian Ty and RJ Martin, making CNC machine blades with like the milling marks in the blades. And I was like, they did it, I can do it too. So I figured it out, actually went to Brian Ty, he was a bit, bit of a mentor to me and he, he didn't teach me how to do it, I just went to his shop and like, went to his shop and let him tell me how he, like what he does. But he didn't exactly say like, here son, this is what you do. And I was just like, oh, I see you, uh, I see you do it like that, okay. Yeah, I see, you okay, yeah, I see what you did there. So I figured it out. And then over the next few years, actually the next few months, I called my brother up and I was like, dude, I call him dude. And my kids call him dude first actually. So I'm like, dude, you gotta come out. He was living in Seattle at the time, I was in Toronto. I'm like, what are you up to right now? Work, working in hotels? How's it going for you? Well, I don't know, not much. <laughs> you gotta come out, you gotta start this business. We gotta, we gotta make knives. I think we have a real opportunity here. This was 2011. Early 2012, he comes out. How am I doing for time? Doing all right. He comes out, we start this business, and then it slowly, very slowly, grows and grows and grows. And it's one of those exponential curves where the first like five years were kind of like, kind of like this. And then now we're sort of in this stage, which I am running out of time and I don't have time to tell the current story, but YouTube has told the current story because we've been chronicling this since 2011 where I literally turned the camera to my face and I said, this is weird, but um, I'm gonna make a knife. Let's, let's figure this out. And marketing wise, that was one of the biggest changes. Before knives, I used to film making the CNC machine like Haas CNC did, you never saw his face. You see his hands. So I was like, okay, I'm building a CNC machine. Here's my hands. And the second I turned the camera around and I was making these knife handles, and people could connect with me on a personal level was a big transformation. I developed 50 subscribers on YouTube over the however many, many years, and they were all like my friends and family and things like that. The second I turned the camera around and started talking to the audience, as I'm doing now, is when that subscriber count started to go up. And once we hit 100, we're like, oh my gosh, this is sweet, this is working. And then we hit 200 and then 500, eventually, slowly, over time. Um, and then we just kept going, we kept pouring everything that we have into what we do, just like I've always done my whole life. And that's, I think I'm out of time, but we got a few more minutes for Q&A, but that's, that's the origin of my story. And then the past seven years have been um, exponential growth every year. Just, we're skyrocketing. I'm so proud of what we've done. And we have a team of six people and I come into work and I, they're doing stuff that I don't have to do anymore because I've taught them how to do it. I've been able to share the experience and share the knowledge and I get to work so much more working on my business now, which is a big thing you hear in the business world, work on your business, not in your business. But in the beginning, you have to work in your business and work on your business. It's only really the past like two to four years and exponentially so that I've been working on my business. And now that I have um, 
employees and team members doing the most of the physical work, I get to do like business development is something I spend a lot of my time on. Um, l learning all about the financing, like accounting used to be such an evil word to me. I didn't want to know anything about accounting. I just, I got a bookkeeper. I feel fancy because just here's all my receipts at the end of the year. But um, that father-in-law that lent me $5,000 now works for us full time. He's a 40 year accountant, CFO. So he is now my CFO. And now I have under, uh, I have accounting down pat. And he's been like taking me under his wing and I know everything about our numbers now which it's like unlocking a puzzle. And now I just understand all, like I understand why finance is such an important business and why understanding your numbers and your accounting and your profit margins and loss and expenses, it is one of the most important things. It's certainly like a big percentage of what, what it takes to run a business. There's, you know, there's making the thing, which for most of us is the coolest part and the only part that matters. But then there's the marketing, which is, you know, I've been doing YouTube and Instagram and things like that. And then there's, running the business and the finance of it and understanding if you're making money or losing money. Whereas before it was just like, yeah, money came in the door. That means we're doing good, right? Right? So things are really, things are really good right now. <laughs> Saunders and I have that podcast, Business and Machining, where we get to, it's like a therapy session. Like, <laughs> I don't think about other people listening to it because I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm having kind of a weird, weird mood right now. Like, I don't know, I don't know how I'm feeling. Or sometimes like, yeah, I'm great. Things, things are awesome, we're crushing it. We're having so much fun. So it, it's a good outlet to be able to do that. But anyway, I'll stop talking because uh, next speaker's coming up soon, but I'll get time for a couple questions. Anybody have any questions for me? Andrew Henry. What attracted you to folders over fixed plates when you started? Good question. I don't like fixed plates. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a hunter. I've always carried a Spyderco pocket knife, folding pocket knife. I love the mechanical intricacy of it. Um, I mean, the knives we make now are very complicated, very detail oriented. For those of you who haven't seen what we make, like detail is everything. Tooth out chamfer has to be perfect all the way around the six lobes of a torque screw. Otherwise I throw it out. So anyway, yeah, I don't like fixed blades. Although I did make 24 fixed blades. And then I was like, that's enough. Yes, sir. What are you carrying in Chicago? Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> <laughs> Private room. No cops, right? Anyway, I am carrying, this is our Norseman knife. This is our flagship product. Uh, folding pocket knife, flipper tab, ball bearings on the inside, titanium handle, stainless steel blade. We manufacture everything from the screws to the clip to the handles. We do it all in-house. We have a Mori CNC mill. We have a Nakamura CNC lathe now. Um, we stepped our way up with Tormac milling machine and Tormac lathe and Tormac surface grinder. And then we got the Mori and the knack and sky's the limit. I'm, I'm not exactly shopping this week, but I'm certainly learning everything I can. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, how do you think about uh, supply and demand? I know you have a lot of demand for your products. And, you know, what is uh, your philosophy? Absolutely. I mean, supply and demand has yeah. been, uh, yeah. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, absolutely. So he, he was asking about supply and demand in, I guess, a product-based industry. Um, now, I'll start, you know, I'll Tarantino this and I'll start at the end. Now, demand is insanely high and supply is as much as we can make. You know, people think we're holding back. No, 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 no. Quality comes first, quantity comes second. We're making as many as we can. We have six people working full-time making knives. It's amazing. Um, so at our current point, demand is super high, but we used to go to knife shows in the beginning and have knives on the table and people would just kind of like walk by. So it's awareness. Like people got to know who you are. They got to know what you do. They got to know why it matters, why you care. And a lot of times it's just like me going on YouTube being like, guys, this is the coolest thing ever. I just did this and I did this and it's like this and it goes down like this. And isn't that awesome? And like four people watching go, yeah, I'll buy one. And then everybody else is like, I don't know what that crazy guy's talking about, but okay, it's kind of interesting. So supply and demand, I don't, it's, it's exponential. Like you really got to let people know why it's important. Otherwise they don't care, you know? So uh, in your experience of kind of during and then all of the effects of it afterwards with Kickstarter, would you do Kickstarter again? Would I do Kickstarter again? I did, my wife and I made titanium ice cubes because we needed some extra money at the time. This was 2014, 13, something like that. Um, we made $5,000. It was, 
It was a ton of work. Didn't make any money. I, I didn't like it. But deeper into your question is the whole pre-order concept of basically taking money up front and then owing people stuff, which I did outside of Kickstarter. We pre-sold like 300 of our new model, the Rask knife. And it was not 300 at once, but it was, you know, we left it open for about a year. And then we, all of a sudden it was great. We had this influx of cash because everybody paid up front and everybody was patient. I was like, look guys, this is gonna take like six to nine months. Please have patience. Please let me, you know, perfect my craft and make this beautiful knife. Except that six to nine months took two years, two and a bit to actually fully, and I was like sick to my stomach because I had everybody's money and I didn't, I couldn't fulfill fast enough because we're such perfectionists that we owed people stuff and it, it was a really dark time for me like two, three years ago, um, trying to, Try, I, I just got to bang out knives, but they're not good enough, so I got to make them better. So we got to put this time into it. And it was only Eric and I at the time, and I, I hate the pre-order model now. But we've surpassed it, and it certainly built us up to that level. So I don't really feel, I'm glad we did it, I guess, but I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Your social media, um, when you're starting out, you, you talk about um, doing the social media. All of it. Share everything. <laughs> Say again? What about when you have like competitors? That's, that's a really good question that I think a lot about and I think people worry a lot about is, well, if I share my cool invention, everybody's going to steal it and copy it. The way that I combat that is I shared more and I researched more and I did more and I got to market first, basically. Even if I didn't, I'm the one sharing, so everybody watching knows that, oh, John's the guy that came up with that. Even if four other people do it at the same time, but they're not sharing as hard as I am. So doing, like, people have definitely copied methods that we do because we put it out there. And I kind of look at that with a little twinge of, you know, resentment, but 90% is like, good for you. I shared something. I'm glad you took it. I'm glad you learned from it. Um, I'm still going to crush you because we're doing awesome. <laughs> You know, so it's like share it if your customer doesn't know why it's important, like I was saying. So for me, it's share everything. And I've been really bad about that lately because I'm so busy working and working on the business and things like that. I wish I could share more. We're doing so much more than what's actually coming out on YouTube. Um, that's just a scale thing. But yeah, I, I'd say share everything. Like you don't have to share financial details and you don't have to share like, you know, when you're crying in the corner because that totally happens. But sometimes it helps. It's good perspective. As you scale and grow the company and volume goes up, what's your strategy to maintain quality and make sure that you can keep it, keep it up? Uh, it's a super good question. As we scale, how are we going to keep quality? And we're finding that now as I'm not operating the CNC machine and inspecting parts coming out. So we've just established, like Jay Pearson's going to talk about, establishing processes for lean so that you know that it fits within your tolerance band, even if it's a visual tolerance band, like that scratch is too big, gotta go back in the tumbler. So it's something I was really worried about hiring people is like, well, if I have other people do this stuff, it's never gonna be as good and because you know, it's me and it's my soul and I care more than anybody else. And, but you come up with this recipe, like our job is not, it is almost not to come up with the best product, it's to come up with the best recipe to make the product and then to share that within your team. And that's all the business development I'm talking about, like, that's what I'm working on. I'm spending so much time trying to make the process stupid easy so that anybody in our shop can run it, even though it's a complex process. So, Tyson. Have you dealt with any secondary market issues like flippers or anything like that where you can adjust All the time. So what have you done to... So, the qu question is, have I dealt with... Um, how am I doing for time here, Bill? Uh, two more questions. Two more questions, got it. Have I dealt with secondary market problems and people flipping the, the knives or product, selling it for a different price, whatever. When demand for our product is way higher than we can possibly produce, we might sell a knife for $900 and it goes up on eBay for $1,800. And Tyson's... Good and bad. It's good and bad. Tyson's having this problem with his golf putters right now too. It's good and bad. I personally don't care 
really, because in the end, somebody's getting the knife that they want, and if they're willing to pay $1,800 for it, wow, either we're not charging enough, or somebody's getting screwed, but he's happy anyway, because he's willing to pay it, so I don't feel so bad. But that did cause us to raise our prices from about the 550 mark to 900, which was a huge jump we did about one year ago. And we thought about it, and we, we you know, cried about it and we thought hard and we're like man we're going to get so much blowback if we raise these prices nobody cares we are still selling more product than ever before at the new price i'm proud of the new price it's worth it there's value oh absolutely like, when i see the older knives you know we, we serialize every single knife so i know how old it is like we're up to 1400 almost 1500 now and when I see a number 137, I'm like, I remember that. That was, that was a long time ago. Because <laughs> the, the output's like exponential, right? So yeah, I like seeing the old work. And I realize, wow, it was really hard back then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, sir? How hard is it for you to transform yourself from the maker to your market? Say again? You transform yourself from a maker to a oh, okay. How hard is that for you? How hard is it to transfer myself from a maker to a marketer? Um, I guess it was kind of natural. Like, like I said, I've always wanted to share what I do, right? So I didn't put a lot of thought into it. At first, it was just like, I'm going to make YouTube videos to document what I do because that seems to work. And then I knew the customers needed to know how I do it, why I do it. I love watching everybody else's videos of how do they do it. So when I learn from somebody else, I want to be able to share that to the next person, but there's so much to learn about marketing that you can only learn by doing. You know, you can read as many Instagram boost articles as you want, but until you, until you go out and do it and start to see the results and start to see what happens, you do it. But it's, it's like an equal, you know, one third on the product, one, like exactly like you were telling me yesterday, one third on the product, one third on the marketing, and one third on the business. And if you can somehow hold that, then it might work. Yeah. One more question? No more? <laughs> no, not you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. You can look at it now. Anyway, who's up next? Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you.